Welcome to another week of This Week in Royal History, where we explore the personal stories, triumphs, and tragedies of the royal figures who have shaped the course of history, delving into their fascinating lives and the legacies they left behind. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Let me take you on a journey back in time to the year 1318, when the world was a vastly different place. It was a time of great political unrest and upheaval, and amidst all the chaos, the little baby girl was born to Edward II of England and Isabella of France at Woodstock Palace. This baby girl was none other than Eleanor, named after her paternal grandmother, Eleanor of Castile. As Eleanor grew up, she must have felt like she was living in a world that was constantly changing around her. At the tender age of 14, she was married off to Reginald II, Count of Gelders, who was almost 23 years her senior. Imagine being a teenager and suddenly being thrust into a marriage with someone so much older than you. Despite the age gap, Eleanor and Reginald had a happy marriage and even had two sons together, Reginald and Edward. But their happiness was short-lived, as Reginald was created Duke of Gelders in 1339, but tragically died just four years later after falling off a horse. Can you imagine the heartbreak that Eleanor must have felt losing her beloved husband so suddenly and unexpectedly? But Eleanor was a strong woman, and she didn't let her grief consume her. She stepped up to the plate and became regent for her nine-year-old son, Reginald III, Duke of Gelders. She ruled with grace and wisdom, but unfortunately her regency only lasted a year. Eleanor died in poverty at a convent on the 22nd of April in 1355 at the age of 36. Eleanor of Woodstock's life may have been short, but it was certainly eventful. From being born into royalty, to marrying an older man, to becoming regent for her young son. Eleanor's story is one of strength, resilience, and determination. So let us remember her today as a woman who faced many challenges in her life, but never gave up. Let's delve even deeper into history with Elizabeth of York, future Duchess of Suffolk, a woman who lived through a time of great political turmoil and upheaval in England. Elizabeth was born into a powerful family. Her father, Richard Plantagenet, was the third Duke of York, and her mother, Cecily Neville, was the daughter of the Earl of Westmoreland. She was the third daughter of her parents, but she also had five brothers, including Edward IV and Richard III, who would both go on to become kings of England. As a member of the aristocracy, Elizabeth was expected to marry well, and she did just that when she wed John de la Pole sometime before 1458. The couple went on to have 13 children together, a number that was not uncommon for noble families at the time. However, not all their children survived to adulthood, which must have been a great source of sadness for Elizabeth and John. Tragically, John's father was executed in 1450 which prevented him from succeeding the dukedom of Suffolk. Despite this setback, John was still referred to as Duke, and in 1463, he was finally restored to the dukedom thanks to the intervention of Elizabeth's brother, Edward IV. This made Elizabeth a duchess, a title that she held with great pride and dignity. Elizabeth lived through many significant events in English history, including the Wars of the Roses, a series of battles fought between the House of Lancaster and House of York for control of the English throne. Her brothers played major roles in these conflicts. Edward IV was the king during the latter part of the war, while Richard III was famously defeated by Henry Tudor, later Henry VII, at the Battle of Bosworth Field. But Elizabeth's own life is not without its struggles. She lived to see the death of her beloved brother, Edward IV, as well as the mysterious disappearance of his two young sons, who were rumored to have been murdered by their uncle, Richard III. Elizabeth's husband also died before her, leaving her a widow. 
Despite these hardships, Elizabeth remained a respected and influential figure in English society. She was known for her piety and devotion to the church, and she was well regarded by many of her contemporaries. When she died sometime between January 1503 and May 1504, she left behind a legacy of strength, resilience, and dignity in the face of adversity. Her story is a reminder of the enduring power of the human spirit, even in the most challenging of times. And now we move on to another pivotal figure in English history, Henry Tudor. Born on the 28th of January, 1457, to Edmund Tudor, 1st Earl of Richmond, and Margaret Beaufort, at Pembroke Castle in Wales. Henry's birth was marked by tragedy as his father died just three months before he was born. His maternal lineage, however, was filled with royalty, as he was the great-great-grandson of John of Gaunt, the son of Edward III. It wasn't until 1485 that Henry Tudor was able to make a successful attempt at landing in England with his forces, where he met Richard III's army at the Battle of Bosworth Field in August. It was there that he emerged victorious, defeating Richard and declaring himself King Henry VII. Henry wasted no time in solidifying his claim to the throne, and he did so by honoring a pledge made in 1483 by marrying Elizabeth of York, the eldest daughter of Edward IV. Their marriage unified the fighting houses of the Wars of the Roses, and it gave their children a stronger claim to the throne. Over the course of their marriage, they had eight children, but only four survived infancy. As king, Henry faced many challenges, including Yorkist plots against his reign. He dealt with these threats with ruthless efficiency, imprisoning and executing many. But he also understood the importance of foreign relations, as seen in the marriages of his eldest son, Arthur, to Catherine of Aragon, and his eldest daughter, Margaret, to James IV of Scotland. The latter part of Henry's reign was marked by tragedy as he lost his son, Arthur, as well as his wife and infant daughter between 1502 and 1503. While he entertained thoughts of getting remarried, they were never fully fulfilled, and his final years were focused on preparing his only surviving son to be king. Henry Tudor died on the 21st of April, 1509, at the age of 52, leaving behind a great fortune and a secure throne for his son, Henry VIII. He was buried at Westminster Abbey next to his beloved wife, Elizabeth, and his legacy lives on as a king who solidified the Tudor dynasty and brought stability to England after years of conflict. Thank you so much for listening. If you love what you hear in this podcast, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Patrons receive commercial-free episodes, early releases, exclusive content, and more. Head over to patreon.com slash Tudor's Dynasty to check out the options available. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.